Welcome into this week's edition of the Three Wise Men. And it's a little light this week as Danny and Miles are out. They had things that they had, they had to get to. Um, they couldn't join us, but I'll tell you what doesn't matter. We're not going to miss them. I'm being joined by somebody that can fill their spots. I'm happy to have you here. Oh boy, I don't know about that. I'll tell you what, Randy Roberts, he is in with me this week. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I know it's uh, not the easiest drive down for you. Oh, that's all right. It's always fun coming down here. Yeah, if, I mean, they they replaced the three wise men with two... Two guys. Just just two guys. Yeah, yeah, just two guys that decided they wanted to talk about something. Sports guys can't do math because they replaced three with two. So, (laughs) So. what are you going to do? All right. First segment, we always start the uh, the week, every week, the same way. The Diamond Dave Bowen, best things we saw all week. This started off as a thing. Dave always likes to get a couple extra. Miles adopted it. So you can uh, you can go one, a hundred. But there's apparently no limit on all the okay. good stuff you saw this week. You know, I saw some, and I, I guess really it just goes back to yesterday. Yesterday being Tuesday, I guess. Uh, I got to take in some high-level volleyball. I called a, a couple district games for uh, an online company that I, I do a little bit of work for, too. So uh, got to go to Defiance and watch a uh, couple uh, Division Six semifinals and saw an undefeated Tenora team that is unbelievably good. They've got hitters all over the floor. Uh, second semifinal, we had Ottawa Hills and Patrick Henry. Ottawa Hills, one of those teams, obviously don't do a lot. Toledo High School sports, don't know a lot about them. Numbers looked impressive, but they've got two girls that uh, have been best friends since about the third grade playing together, and these two girls look like it, and they team up really well. A setter, a hitter, it was fantastic, and uh, I get to watch these two teams play again Thursday night. I'm really looking forward to it, and that's the best thing I saw this nice. week. And, you know, I'm not a huge volleyball guy. I, I never have been. Last couple of years, I've been getting into it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Gotten to do, do some games for WSN. That's always been that's been fun. I got to do the night game over in uh, yeah, Shawnee. You and Miles yeah, got to, yeah, yeah, I got to fill in there, and, and, and that w- that was great. But uh, these guys are always talking about, and you know, um, you know, Mark Shine and Dave Bowen. They always talk about as well the high level of volleyball that we get in this area. I mean, yeah. and obviously, I know you call a lot of it. It, it seems to me that. I don't know that there's a better, you know, Northwest Ohio may be the best area for high school football in the state, at least from what those guys talk about and what I've seen. Yeah, it's uh, even the the smaller schools, you know, everyone kind of discounts the big schools because Cincinnati, big school volleyball with what uh, the St. Ursula's done is, is unbelievable. But when you get down to the smaller schools, I don't think anyone touches what goes on in Northwest Ohio. And obviously, uh, just a little bit south of me, the region is obviously really good. New Bremen's been on an unbelievable run in volleyball lately. Yeah. You know, that's uh, another program. But uh, what I get to see, you know, Archibald has an unbelievable history with a bunch of state titles. Got to see them a lot. You know, Tenora on this run that they've been on here the last handful of years and, and the run they've been on. It's it's really high-level stuff. Yeah. yeah, a lot of good volleyball going on. WSN's got a bunch of it, so make sure you check out the schedule, see a bunch of uh, and really too, great teams. Right? Soccer, soccer, absolutely. You know, uh, districts are heating up, district finals on top. Then, you know, regional semis, we have some good matchups, a couple of teams in this area looking like maybe a state run, too. So a lot of great stuff other than all the great football we got going on, too, going on in this area. So uh, my best thing of the week is actually a sequence of plays that happened in the Ottawa Glendorf Shawnee game. Okay, Ottawa Glendorf Shawnee playing Shawnee fighting for their lives. They win that one. Their percentage percentage for playoffs go up to like 85 percent. Right. Like it was a must win game for them. Ottawa Glandor's defense been playing great all year long, so much more improved every single week, especially compared to last year. So Shawnee has been struggling offensively, but things got moving a little bit better in this one. Uh, they moved the ball on OG. They get down late in the second quarter, down into the red zone for the Titans. Okay? Oh, okay. They get down to the one-yard line. It is first and goal from the one. Four straight plays, Ottawa Glandor stops them. Wow. Okay. And it wasn't because of Shawnee throwing the ball in completion. I mean, it was, we're going to line up, you're going to line up, we're going to go hat on hat, and we'll see who gets the push. OG won four straight times. They take over on downs. It's not over. They take over on downs. They then go 99 yards in three plays to score the touchdown that eventually would be the difference in this game as it was a 21-14 final. Holy smokes. That sequence 
essentially ended up being the difference in the game and won it for the Titans. It was a tremendous – they've been leaning on that defense for most of the season. Yeah. Um, and it came through when it mattered the most. It, it was It was really – even though I was on the other sideline and I'm on that Shawnee side and it wasn't <laughs> a sequence I was happy with, mm-hmm. it was incredibly impressive to, to see. And just as an honorable mention to that, I uh, got to give a shout-out to Walpock Canetta. Walpock won their sixth straight WBL title. They are outright yeah. champs. The only year they haven't won it was that 2020 COVID season when WBL just didn't even give one out. The, other than that, they've either won it outright or a share of it six straight years. Very, very impressive in a Western Buckeye League that is very difficult. This is not a top-heavy uh, conference uh, by any stretch. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Miles and I have have done, I think, just WBL up till this last week, and we had uh, Columbus Grove and LCC. That's the same thing we've said, where we know Wapak's going to be good, and then it, it's rolling the dice trying to figure out who's who's second. Who's yeah. third? Who's yeah, I mean, and, it, it's a no gauntlet. One, yeah. Well, you know, prior to coming on, you and I were talking about Drew Pasture, and if people haven't seen it, Fantastic Fifty. Great it, website, it's a great yeah. website. Great it's website. it's a good resource for us to use. Um, he has a bunch of kind of obscure things as too, and one is he always does strength of schedule, and he he does all these other things. At one point, Shawnee had the second hardest schedule in all of <laughs> Division Three football, and as you start to go through. Every WBL team was like in the top 10 yep. because they just devour each other <laughs> yeah. and how difficult every week is in the WBL. It was insane what they were doing. That's now that strength of schedules helping some of these WBL teams get into the playoffs right, on the right. back end. But man, it is top to bottom, one of the most difficult conferences in the entire maybe the state. It's always been tough because it's you know, for as long as I can remember, right? It's that nine game schedule. Everyone else, most everyone else. You know, you get two or three, yep. you know, the non-con warm-up games, right? And then you're ready to go. But you get one. Yeah. You know, and most of that time, it's a rivalry game. Oh, yep. Again, I'll use Defiance, the, the closest team to me. It's been Napoleon, yep. right? And that game, it talked to certain coaches. That game means more to them than almost any oh. game, uh, uh, just about every game yeah. on the schedule, depending on how good you are. And and then you, it's nine straight wars in the <laughs> yep. WBL, and it's been unbelievable. And I've got to see it really firsthand for the first time this year. And I just, WBL's so tough. Yeah. And these teams are all going to be battle ready, and I th- we'll probably talk about it a little bit later. These teams are going to go into the playoffs, and you're going to see a 5-5, a 6-4 five and five, six and four WBL team going, well, they're, they're, five, they're 500. How good can they be? Well, yeah, and you'll see them make a run. Find out. Absolutely. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that was best things of the week. A lot of great things going on for us. Uh, coming up, we're going to welcome in Landon Warstrester and uh, Jeff Richard, both of Bluffton. They have a huge rivalry game coming up. They're going to be sitting in the seats. We're going to be talking with them in just a second. We are being joined now by two guys who, you know, may have one of, if not the biggest weeks ahead of them. Coach Richards, Landon, thank you guys for joining us. From the Bluffton Pirates, you guys are having a tremendous season, 9-0 and heading into Week 10 and a chance to play for a conference title. Can't really ask for much more than that. Yeah, I mean, it's beginning of the year. Your goal is to get to this situation. You know, we set goals at the beginning of the season, and it's always win the next game. But in reality, it's always win the next game so you get for that chance to win a conference championship Week 10. Yeah, how about for you, Landon? Obviously, you know everything that's on the line this week. You guys have had a great season so far. What does it mean for all, you for all that work to finally kind of have a chance to come to fruition with a, you know, a win on Friday? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think since last year we've been talking about, you know, since the end of last year we've been talking about this year. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been awesome leading up to this. And being able to be nine and zero and putting ourselves in this position has been it's been awesome. So we're all we're all excited to have the opportunity to finally go ten and zero. Yeah, you guys were uh, kind of in the spot last year too, right? In a, a tough one. And what did you guys take from from the games last year? You kind of used this year. Came down to mistakes, you know, opportunities and making the most of them. Uh, you know, we had uh, one possession game week 10 last year and we got a rematch in the regional finals and it came down to one possession again so you know it's bitter you know it hurts but it's a good learning opportunity especially when you bring back a bunch of guys who had that experience the year before you know you talk about those games from from last year and you know it's just us coach no one else is listening (laughs) (laughs) you know I I know the coach speak is week to week but look I mean I've been a coach a long time at a certain point, even if you're telling the kids, hey, week 10 will take care of week 10 when we get there. As a coach and as a staff, there had to be a little bit of, hey, we're, we're, we're getting ready for week 10 here a little bit every week. 
Well, for us, what we do, our, our prep every week is exactly the same. You know, what we focus on, each, our Mondays are always the same, our Tuesdays, except for this year we had two Saturday games, which changed it up a little bit. But, you know, our big emphasis to the kids is we have to improve every single week. Now, in reality, we have to improve every single week so we can get those, you know, make that run in the playoffs, have an opportunity to win a conference championship or even a bigger championship down the road. So that emphasis never changes. But... Uh, at some point or another, they're always looking ahead. You have to a lot of times tell them, you know, hey, we're focused on week uh -huh. eight, week nine, and then week ten. So, you know, that's a battle, I think, is keeping the kids focused on each week at a time. But as coaches, you're always looking ahead. As much as I hate constantly bringing him up when he's not here, but that was the thing Miles Hollett, you know, Miles tells me all the time, right, is, again, another former football coach. I was just a poor third-string lineman who never played, but <laughs> – you know, you're not. I like, guess you know, his his thought was, we're, you know, we're we're telling the kids it's you know opponent X ahead of us, but let's let's not kid ourselves. We're spending 20 minutes, you know, maybe <laughs> looking at something going on with. Well, we're we're saying it's in right. the playbook for this Friday, right. but, but we're not going to show it until we. Well, you always have the stuff. You, you put it in for an opponent, and for some reason or another, you don't have to use it that week, so you just hang on to it right, for it's just, it's in the seven back or eight pocket. weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you never know. Yeah. Holding on to this for the right time. Yeah, yeah, you know, it just happens to be at the end of the year. It's That's fine. Right. Yeah. You know, Landon, how's that work for you? I mean, obviously, you know, as a leader on the team, you know, one, trying to make sure that the guys stay focused, right? I mean, I know we're kind of joking about it, but – Everybody, and you guys aren't immune to it, it talks about it even before the season, right? Week 10, this potential matchup, everybody kind of knew how good you guys, both teams were going to be, and this could be coming down the pike. And as it got closer and closer and closer, how did you guys keep as keep your teammates focused and keep guys from, hey, looking ahead or maybe overlooking the opponent coming up to make sure that you stayed focused on the goal at hand? Um, well, obviously, we do, uh, we do a really good job at watching film, you know, so... I feel like one thing is a lot of us can get together and we can, you know, watch film of this week's opponent together and we can really dive into that and see what things we can really pick on through that instead of, you know, talking about week 10 or talking about anything in the playoffs. We can get together, we can watch film about the opponent we're going to play and, you know, I feel like that always helps for sure. How, how has it been this week trying to shut out all that extra chatter? Right, like there has to be a bunch. You got a bunch of knuckleheads yeah, asking you, you to come like onto a podcast <laughs> and talk yeah, about yeah. it. I can't imagine what it's like in the community because I mean it's such a, a supportive community. You guys, you know, play in and live in, and you know, just all of the extra stuff that surrounds a, a game week like this one. We uh, was it Friday night? I told you guys it was Grove Week. Oh yeah, that started, yeah. and there's some things that come with that, and, and a lot of it is <clears> blocking out that other noise. Um, and there's going to be, you know, there's going to be talk. There's going to be people excited. And that's one of the best parts about, you know, small school, high school football in the state of Ohio is both communities are super excited. It's a really, really big game. Um, but we have to control what is in our realm to control. We can't worry about anything outside of what we need to handle. And we lean on our seniors and our leaders to really be the ones that kind of pay that forward for the younger guys. And so the younger guys understand, like, we have a job to do throughout the week yep. has that been easy for you this week yeah I mean at the end of the day there's 11 guys on offense and 11 guys on defense and those are the only guys that are going to win you the game so that's kind of how I think about it hey, speaking of those 11 guys on defense cool. uh, don't want to go too much into <laughs> the X's and O's we're going I think we're going to do a little bit that with that later on but uh you know obviously what what Columbus Grove brings offensively and everyone knows about Trent Barraza uh you guys feel a little I was over undershadowed the right word because it, it seems like all the focus has been on you know the run game of Columbus Grove is unbelievable and, and then is there oh but Bluffton brings the number one defense of the conference into this game like does it feel like something where you, you maybe you're you're feeling a little disrespected a little bit I, I think it really comes down to uh yeah they have an amazing run <laughs> offense they uh you know Trent Barraza is a heck of a player um and they do a great job their coach Schaefer staff does an amazing job uh, but, you know, our defense has been pretty successful the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, they do a great job of preparing every single week, and they work very, very hard. Uh, our guys don't really take it as a personal thing, you know. Uh, we look at it more as it's not one person mm -hmm. getting their name called all the time on defense. It's the whole group, and they swarm to the football. 
So, all right, light, I, I like the lighter side of sports, so let me ask you kind of a silly question because, again, Miles isn't here, so someone has to ask silly questions. Rivalry week, what does that mean? Does that mean no no season G's used in town all week? No, <laughs> no what, what, what do you guys, you know, are you, you blocking things out? Are you... You know, if you're, you're not allowed to walk your bulldog through town, like that goes, <laughs> what, what goes on this week with Rivalry Week? Well, I know. I know, especially around the middle school, because we all, a couple of us football guys work in the cafeteria over there. There's been a lot of, a lot of C's that have been X out over there. We nice. That's I like right. it. I like That's, it. Yep. That's <laughs> you know, rivalry, that always. So. Yep. Um, you know, it's talking about that defense. You know, I mean, Coach, what you guys have been able to do defensively over the last two years has been – ridiculous i mean the the amount of points that you guys are giving up or i guess better said lack thereof coming into this one just over six points a game last year prior to week 10 you guys had didn't even give up a point in the conference how is it that you've been able to build this defense and been able to sustain the success not over like oh one or two games where we had a good stretch i mean this is your system at this point i, I give the majority of the credit uh, my staff has has worked extremely hard jason diller's my defensive coordinator um, and he does an amazing job from week to week. But then, you know, position coaches, uh, I kind of, I, I stepped back and, and really wanted to, to build my staff to be as good as I possibly could. Uh, and, and I have every single coach on my staff coaches one position and one side of the ball, and they do it to the best of their ability. And I, my defensive staff has gelled very, very well. And offensive staff has gelled very, very well. Um, but, you know, Coach Diller, he does a great job, you know, with the game plan each week. He, he's great with communication. We we have long conversations about stuff about what we need to do from week to week. And then, you know, I think complimentary football is big, and our offensive and defensive staffs are very complimentary. We want to make sure on offense we don't put the defense in a bad situation, and special teams same. That's the same boat. And uh, if you can give a team the entire field to have to drive every single possession, your defense is going to probably do pretty well. And then it comes down to having some, you know, great young men that can perform very, very well. And, you know, last year we had a it – was, it was a fun statistical thing where everybody was, you know, bringing up our shutout streak and, and the nine shutouts and things like that. But, you know, this year bringing back – a handful of experienced guys and then guys that stepped into roles that were left from the class before them. Uh, that's, I really think it comes down to, you know, the coaching staff gets them prepared and the kids play as hard as they can. You know, I, in, in my dumb brain coming into this year, I, I had looked and I thought, you know, I don't know if Bluffton's going to be where they were last year, right? You guys graduated a lot. You guys had been down for a little while. It's kind of been, you know, up and down, yeah. not kind of maybe that sustained success that we had seen in years past. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, there's some questions to be answered. Yeah. And then you guys come out and then there were some people, you know, well, maybe the schedule was a little mm -hmm. light coming in. Is this, and every week you've answered every single question over, it seems like Bluffton's back to a reload, not a rebuild type thing. I, I want to know what, you can give that credit to. I think I have my opinion because I looked at your your ex or Twitter or however mm -hmm. people want, want to know. And as I'm scroll, scrolling through your stuff to kind of get ready for today, I did not see a single men mention on your entire ex profile about your high school team. Yeah. Everything on there was about the junior high, their success, the, the um, youth programs, their success, the flags, their success. All, all, everything was anything but high school. Yeah. Uh, is that intentional? Is that how you're trying to build this program? Because well, that was really impressive. Well, and this is year nine for me. So this has been a process, you know, from the beginning. And, and a lot of it came down to we wanted to establish a culture and then develop a program, not just a team. And that's not a, a quick turnaround. I mean, I was talking with somebody the other day. These guys that are seniors, when they were in seventh grade, they started lifting weights with the high school team. And, and it was – you know, one, we saw it was a pretty talented group, but then two, they were hanging around the weight room all the time. So I figured, might as well get them in the weight room, left them <laughs> right. hanging around. Might as well do something like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we try to have kind of a, a top down approach. You know, the junior high staff and the high school staff has communication with each other, and we want to develop from the ground up. So, you know, there's a big emphasis with that. We do our Saturday morning uh, flag football club, which is just a fun thing for kids that are kindergarten through third grade. And the high school players are the ones that run it. I just kind of sit back and, and watch. And it gets the community involved. It gets kids excited about football. And it's also just, you know, it promotes the program. And the kids, year to year, they have a blast with it. Kids come back and remember that they were a part of something the year before, and, and they get excited about it. 
And then I've got guys that are, you know, they help in classrooms, they help in the cafeteria, they're, they're everywhere. So being a part of the football program isn't just playing on Friday nights. It's a much bigger role. You know, and what, so what does that mean for you, Landon? Obviously, you know, as Coach said, this started early for you, for you in this group. And as you've seen this thing kind of grow and the success that you guys have been able to have and, and maintain, what does it mean for you to be able to pass things down? Or what is it that you pass down to these guys to hopefully sustain the success long term? Um, so, I mean, I've... I have a great group of friends and you know even the great above me has been a great class and I think we really have done a good job at you know leading by example you know I think we started coming in the summer showing up every single day and I think guys see that and I know for a fact a lot of the younger classmen you know they don't want to be you know scrutinized for not showing up to lifting five times a week so they they come five times a week. So and that that's what you're talking about. That's culture. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of programs where you know the seniors will show up, but the younger guys, yeah. it, they you know it's fine. If I'm not there, I'm not mm-hmm. there. I mean that definitely does speak yeah. on the culture you were talking mm-hmm. about. And it gets to the thing now where you you want to you don't want to be the class that stops that, right? Like yeah. you know these last two years have been unbelievable. Now you don't want the you know the freshmen, the eighth graders when they get up. Hey, look what all these guys in front of us did. Like we're not going to be the ones that that mm-hmm. that you know, take a step back. Yeah. And it, I actually credit, um, the 2020 COVID year. I know a lot of programs had some struggles and stuff. I think our program took a big jump forward in that year. That was the year we started doing leadership meetings and things like that to kind of promote growth within the program. And in the springtime, you know, these guys, they wake up for about a month and a half once a week. And we do meetings in my classroom before school starts. And, and go over leadership and, and things like that that are going to prepare them not just for football but for life. And a big focus on that is, you know, you're planting seeds that you might not see the, the fruits of that by the time your your time is up. And and they've had that, they've seen, and now there's guys that come back and they look and see what the program's done in the past few years, and they understand they were a part of building that, which is always big. So this might be a dumb question considering the week <laughs> that we're in, okay? Mm-hmm. But – uh, of all the teams that you play, what's the one team that you want to or enjoy beating the most? Columbus Grove. All right. And you know what I love the most out of that is you looked over at Coach to make sure it was okay <laughs> to say it because we don't want to get bulletin board with two, right? Like, you That's know. Right. Now, and, but I'm, that, I, I, I kind of figured, right? That's why I said this might be a dumb question. So that leads me into my next and, you know, the kind of the elephant in the room. It's been a while yeah. since you guys have gotten mm-hmm. that, that, that win. What is this week, this buildup? I mean, obviously, this is a big rivalry. There's a lot at stake anyway, but there's also not going to be any rematch this yeah. year. You guys are in two different divisions this season. There, This is it. Mm-hmm. You know, what has it been like trying to get ready and knowing that it's been a minute, there's a conference title on the line, and, you know, this this is going to be it for your, you know, group that you've had mm-hmm. for quite a while. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's been a, a few years, and I, I credit Coach Schaefer and his staff because they've had an amazing run the past handful of years. I mean, they've been state semifinals, what, for the last five years. So, you know, they've had some fantastic teams. Uh, last year, I think, was big for our program. You know, we came up short in those games, but it was it was eye-opening for our players afterwards to look, and they understood how close they were. Uh, and that's a feeling they carried with them all off season. So this is something, you know, we play week to week. We put our focus each week is to win that game. But w- we were driven throughout the off season with – understanding how close we were to the state semifinals last year and we came up short. So, you know, it's a huge game for us. It's a huge game for Columbus Grove because you're playing for a championship, but then also it's that rivalry game. It's it's our Ohio State Michigan. It's you know, it's the biggest game on the regular season schedule for us. So Landon, after high school's over, man, you know, we moved on, we get through this, playoffs, all the good things that could happen there. What's next for you? Um so I'm going into nursing. That's okay. what that's what I'm going to go into college for. You know, I I plan to play college football. All right. Anywhere in particular yet? No, not not you know not yet. I'm not going to set my mind on anything. But you know that's you know, that's the plan as of now. How's recruiting going? Good. I've got a. I've been in contact with some schools. You know, Division three, Division two. So and I'm, 
super excited that I get the opportunity to, you know, play at the next level. So how, how's that recruiting? I love talking to kids about recruiting only in the sense that this is the only time in your life that you're going to get to experience yeah. anything like this, right? Recruiting is this weird, yeah, unique, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah, than anything it, else. It, it, and it can be a lot of fun, but it can also be a, a distraction. And how has that been? Have you been able to balance kind of, you know, the expectations you have for yourself, knowing that there's, you know, opportunities out there for you but also trying to stay focused on what you got to do I mean I think I just know you know if I perform week to week like I know I have to to you know win football games that you know college teams will start recruiting so I mean that's it's not really my goal to get recruited by a bunch of college schools but I know if I can go out and perform week to week that it'll happen that's great and how about for you coach because you know I know recruiting just doesn't happen to the kids the coaches yeah. are very yeah. much involved as well you know how, how have you been able to balance I mean I know it's a little bit of a slow time right now because mm -hmm. yeah. you know college is obviously coaching their yeah. own stuff but things come and go there's correspondence phone calls yeah. visits yeah. you know kids they're ki I mean I don't blame any kid who's like oh I got this school yeah. calling or yeah. checking in like you know how's that been from the coaching side of it trying to keep guys hey it's this is great but we yeah. still got something to do it's i i always view it and, and i've been lucky enough to be mentored by some guys who were successful division one college coaches who, who have a track record with that and you know getting an offer from a school or getting recruited from a school that is a direct result of the work you've put in but it doesn't end with just that that's actually the beginning of something else so you know the focus is you know that yeah that's great but you've got even more work to do because every level you have that welcome to football moment. And if you go and play at the collegiate level, nope. your welcome to football moment is a lot bigger than it was in high school. <laughs> that's, so, that's, that's what I was saying, right? You, you, you spend time in the weight room or practice. You go, well, you think this is tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's Wait great. Until yeah, you know, our, our class that graduated last year, we had a few guys go and they're playing collegiately right now and them coming back and, and through text messages and things about us, how are you doing, or, you know, in the preseason, you get that text of, oh, it's a lot faster, you know, it's a lot bigger, <laughs> things like that. And yeah, it is. And, and that's why you have to put all that work in. And that's all of the stuff that nobody ever sees. They just see that end result. They see the guys on Saturdays in college playing, but they don't see the hours and hours and hours that go into it. Yeah. You got I anything think I'm else? good. All right. Well, hey, listen, we really appreciate you guys coming in and spending time. We know it's a big week. You guys have got a lot that you're getting ready for, not just, you know, the game on Friday night. Uh, postseason coming in behind it already locked into a one or two seed yep. so you know you're going to be hosting a couple of playoff games we got the lights fixed over there right we, we did we're, 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 all, we're all good with I'll, the I'll blame the hurricane right. I'll blame good. the hurricane for that <laughs> I've already had one yeah we've already dealt with one light issue this year <laughs> so, for miles and I so yeah. look forward to, this will be the uh, I guess any advice for me this will be actually my first game at Bluffton High School so anything I need to look out for what do we, get there let's, earlier. Let's, you're let's walking. Get the, let's get the important part out of the way for a big fat guy. Best thing I need to go buy in the concession stand when I get there. Oh, I don't, they're probably going to have some special stuff this okay. weekend. Too, yeah. so. yeah. our, our music boosters run the uh, concession. So can, they'll take it. Tell, like, I, I, I enjoy Hamburger food. is going to be right? named Bulldogs this week. Is that, is, that what we're doing? is that what we're doing in the concession stand? <laughs> so. We don't have our cannon that shoots off anymore. That used to have to warn officials for that. When okay. they used to shoot it. <laughs> well, guys, best of luck the rest of the season. Best of luck Friday night into the postseason. You know, we're going to be watching. We're going to be excited to see how you guys do. Um, it, it's been a great season, and we can't wait to see how things finish for you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. I mean, Randy, Coach, uh, Coach Richards and Landon, they couldn't ha have been better. First time I've ever really had a chance to sit down and talk with those guys. Yeah, me too. Um, you know, uh, I don't think I've even ever met Coach Richards. Uh, I mean, I was a little intimidated with him walking in here. I thought he might bench press Boy, me. That, big that, there is no doubting or no uh, reason anymore. I, I don't, I'm not speculating on why that defense is good. <laughs> that is a defensive man if I've ever yeah, seen it. Uh, and, you know, uh, I but mean, he, he hasn't missed any time in the weight room. No, that, yeah, he started all them in there early because he's like, I'm here too. Let's go, guys. <laughs> you got, you know, if you get through my workout, we're going to be a pretty good team. And, uh, you know, that, that Bluffton team is, is really good, and they're, uh, I think, going to have a lot of success moving forward. And, you know, there's a lot of great games, though, on Week 10 schedule before we get into the postseason. So let's jump into it. First, the games that are going to be on WSN this week, we have a whole plethora of them, six games, a lot of great matchups, starting first with a rivalry game down Route 66, Spencerville traveling over to Delphus Jefferson. Patrick Kamler and Darnell Grohl will be on the call for that one. How do you see that one? 
This one's an interesting one. Spencerville pretty much in with a win in the playoffs, right? Yeah. At four and five. Yep. So a lot to play for. Jefferson at, at one and eight hasn't been the year they wanted. At Spencerville, how do you come back? You you suffered a tough loss to LCC. You had a tough one to Crestview. You know, what's your mindset like here? There's still uh, on the road, like you said, a rivalry game with Jefferson. So let's see what uh, what Spencerville can do and what Spencerville team shows up. Yeah, I mean, this was a game last year that uh, Jefferson actually got, you know, and I think that surprised a lot of people because it's a rivalry game. Mm -hmm. Anything can happen in these games. I've been a part of that Delphus Jefferson Spencerville rivalry week. You know, everything we talked about with Grove and, and Bluffton earlier, right. the same applies with Delphus yeah, Jefferson there's... and Spencerville. They don't like each other. <laughs> they get up for this game. Yep. You, you mentioned it. Not the greatest season for Delphus Jefferson, starting off with the new coach with Alan Pullman, but these things don't happen overnight, right? right. Coach Richards even talked about it. This was a nine-year progress yeah. for them. Teams don't just come in and say, okay, now we're a completely different team with a new identity and a new coach and everything's great. Coaches take time. They, it, it doesn't all happen all at once. Delphi Jefferson has been bit by the injury bug very badly this yeah, year, unfortunately. They've rough, had yeah. a lot of, of tough injuries. They Those kids have continued to fight, though. They've been on the wrong side of some lopsided scores, but that hasn't stopped them. And to me, the, the the biggest thing that you can tell on a team that hasn't quit on themselves, on their teammates, or on their coaching staff is, are we still scoring even when the game's out of hand? And Jefferson does that. They still are scoring touchdowns late into games, which means they haven't tuned things out. They're not just, you know, oh, we're out mm -hmm. here, you know, clocking in, clocking out, right. no big deal, you know, let's get this out of here, the clock's running, we want to get on the bus. They're still playing, they're still executing, they're still trying to make something happen. That's a good place to start for Coach Pullman. And, you know, he gets he played in this rivalry game. He's a Delphus Jefferson alum. He knows how big this game is. Spencerville, you know, maybe they're looking past Delphus or the, the Wildcats, right? They know they're in the playoffs. Yeah, they, this is a rivalry game, but maybe it's one they think that they're going to win pretty easily. You know, don't, don't count the Jeff Cats out. Maybe they can get in there and sneak a win. Yeah, you know, one of the big things I always like uh, about teams that kind of struggle is uh, – especially late in the year, you get a roster. If it's a team you haven't seen, maybe you don't know a lot about, and there's there's 40 kids listed, and then you go, and, like, why are there only 22 in uniform? And then you oh, yeah, you guys walk. Hey, you know what? I'm not a part of losing. So give, like you said, give Jefferson a lot of credit. These kids have stuck around. They want to build something, and uh, this will be, you know, a, a good way for them to end the year. Yeah, it didn't go the way they wanted, but – you know, you want to ruin Spencerville season that will beat them in yep. a rivalry game and keep them out of the playoffs. Like, yep. what more could you or do? Or even if they get in, you get you get a real bad taste heading That's into right. a week 11. So that, that one will be a good one to match up. That's a Thursday night matchup. They get kind of that solo spot, so spotlight on them over in Delphus Jefferson. Excited to see how that one pans out. Game two. The one that everybody's talking about, right? We got one and one A this this week. Yep. Um, and this one is one of the two in those spots. Columbus Grove traveling to Bluffton. Randy, you and Miles will be on that call. You get a sideline reporter. Evan Skilder will be yeah, there helping you really guys out as well. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Yeah. So uh, we, we have talked about trying to find a way to Photoshop a pirate hat onto Evan, and then we'll get <laughs> we'll get a graphic. You know, Ken Reeker can do amazing things. Mm, you're right; us. he so sure Ken, can. Ken does great stuff. So we're trying to figure out a way we can we can Photoshop Evan in some some situations. Maybe he wouldn't want to be in, but you know what more can you ask for in a, a, a rivalry game at the end of the year? Two nine and O's, you know, top a, a top seed on the line for the winner. You know, the loser's going to be a two. Is there really a difference between one and a two? You know, you're going to get, you know, yeah. you, you you have to wear a different jersey when you <laughs> oh, make right. it to, the, you know, the it's regional the, final or right. whatever. But, you know, that still, it means a lot. Northwest Conference Championship on the line. Uh, you mentioned it when we talked to Coach Richards. It's seven in a row for Grove yep. in this series. So Bluffton wants to try to get through that. And uh, I kind of hinted at it when we uh, had the interview earlier. I'm interested to see this number one ranked Northwest Conference defense of Bluffton up against what Grove can do. You know, everyone's talked about Trent Barraza. Everyone knows, you know, the the 30 hundred yard games or 3,100 yard games. I think it is now. And you know, the 1300 rushing yards and everything else. And I give Grove credit. They still try to attack through the air. You know, they've gone through some quarterback injuries and it's mm -hmm. not one dimensional. They'll still throw the ball enough to keep you honest, but you know what? Bluffton's number one against the pass too. So interested yeah. to see, you know, that matchup on that side of the ball. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things that gets overlooked the most with this Grove team is that they have had to go through a lot of starting quarterbacks. Yeah. It, and 
and it's not just the Trent Barraza show. It helps when you can hand the ball off to him it, for yeah, that's, sure. That's when what you, we've learned. But, you know, they're getting better now. They're, they're you know, Landon Bass um, had the broken leg earlier in the season. They had to go to the second string. He, unfortunately, gets hurt as well. They're on the third string now. But he is getting better, too. He just he came off back-to-back weeks of throwing for 200 yards. Yeah. He, and he's efficient. He's not making mistakes. And that is what is going to be key because Columbus Grove – had a lot of turnovers, right? Offense is great. Both of these teams average over 40 points a game. They know how to light up a scoreboard. Mm-hmm. Defense wins you championships. Offense wins games. Defense can win it all. Defensively, phenomenal teams, right? We talked about Coach Richards. Six points a game. Right. Grove only giving up, I think, 9, 10, 11, something like that. They're number two right behind them. Yep. The difference is turnovers. Bluffton has only had four turnovers this season. Columbus Grove, 11. Yeah, and Miles the, and I saw two of them against uh, LCC last week. Yeah. There's still still some things being worked out, but yeah, it's... Uh, so I think that when you're talking about two teams, super evenly matched, mm-hmm. good in all areas, uh, you know, force on force, you know, high scoring offenses, defenses that shut everybody down, something's going to have to give. What usually happens, it's mistakes, right? It's penalties or it's turnovers. Yep. And right now, Bluffton has been the more sound team when it comes to those areas. I could easily come down to the to be the difference in this one. Yeah, you know, Miles like to say it's that unusual event, right? You, yeah. It's going to be a, a, a blocked punt or a muffed kick or, you know, it's going to be some sort of unusual event, I think, is going to be the difference in this one. All right, so moving on, game number three. Now we get to Ken, <laughs> Randy. It's going to be <laughs> Kenton going over to Shawnee. Patrick Kamler and now yours truly are going to be on that call. I got to give a quick shout out to John Zerby. John Zerby was originally supposed to uh, be the color guy on this game. You know, we haven't tried to hide the fact. My son plays for Shawnee. He is a senior. Mm-hmm. They're not making the playoffs, unfortunately. Um, so this is going to be his last game. Last time he's going to suit up. Last time he's going to be playing on home field. You know, get a little bit of the dad feels going on last week of high school football um john very graciously allowed me to get into the booth to have the opportunity to call my son's last game something that is going to be a great memory for him and i so i get to be on the call for this one you know maybe not that high profile you know a conference championship playoff spot as both right. ken and shawnee are, are both out of that playoff race you know but when you're playing in week 10, especially when you're trying to turn around teams, right? Shawnee is on a first year head coach with coach Shane Wireman. Yes. Kenton has played five one loss games this season. They could easily be on the other side of this going into the playoffs. When you're trying to just finish the, the season on a high note and get some momentum to go into the off season as you're working your programs and trying to turn things around, a week 10 win can go a very long way. Yeah. You know, uh, thing I always like to say is, yeah, it's not the it's not the high profile game, right? It's not it's not Grove Bluffton, we'll say for example. But for you, you know, for for the kids for Shawnee, for the kids for Kenton, it's the most important absolutely one they're going to play, right? Yep. So uh, I, I was I understand that as someone that played on some bad football teams as well. But uh, yeah, you know, Coach Wireman, uh, get off to that fantastic start, right? Those yep. two big wins at the beginning of the year, and I'm, by no means they think he was going to you know have a, a ten and zero year right. like he did at Wingsfield Goshen. Did a, an amazing job at Wingsfield. Yeah, and, and great they're coach. Still, right, yeah, and, and they're still you know we're going to get to them in a little bit and what's at the line for them, but. Uh, you know, again, like we we kind of talked about it before we started, the WBL is just so hard to figure out. You know, the the mid like the the top is obviously Wapak, and then I saw it, and and the best example I have is Ottawa Glandorf. Like Ottawa Glandorf at the beginning of the year, Miles and I had them with Liberty Benton, and we walked out of the football field going, "How is OG going to win a game? Like this is what?" And then. Here they are, you know, yeah. they're going to be in a, a playoff team. and, and They're playing for a home, yeah, home they're, game. Yeah, they're lots on the line. And it seems like that that middle's always moved. You know, unfortunately, someone's had to be on the, the rough end of these games, right? And it seems to have been, for the most part, Kenton and Shawnee. Uh, I know Elida's kind of in that group as yeah. well. But uh, you didn't have to snicker like that when yeah. I mentioned Elida. Well, no, I mean, you're right. <laughs> and only because of the sense that, I don't know that there's been a team all season that has been more up and down than that Elida team because some weeks that offense looks prolific. Yeah. And and it looks amazing. You're like, okay, they they figured it out. We're good. And then the next week, it all goes away. They, they they can't figure out how to move the ball. And you're like, well, what just happened? And but then the next week the offense is back yep. up. It, consistency has been their their 
the enemy all season long. Yeah, and a lot of teams, and again, this isn't, we'll, we'll get to the X's and O's of this particular game, but Bath's been that way. I think Defiance has been that way at times. Yeah. So it's just been weird. So uh, uh, you say Shawnee's out. I say not eliminated yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put that, right. that that parent realistic hat on, right? <laughs> I'm trying to be like, all right, I'm not getting my hopes up. Specifically, yeah. and then, yeah. So this game was so important to me that I put it at the top of my notes, where I, that's the first one I'm <laughs> yeah. reading off. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a big, yeah, like you said, like you can – Right, winning cures a lot of things, yeah. right? And you can have a bad year, but if you you walk off the field that last time with the win, you know, because you know you get into the playoffs, there's only a certain number of teams that end the year with a win, exactly. right? So you know, if you're, if you're Shawnee, you're Ken, it'd be a good a good way to end the season by getting a win here. Well, and if you're Ken too, you like I said, that you know, they've had five one loss or five one, 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 score, one score losses this season. That that has got. To, I mean, I that is so brutal because you just know that me that one play right, one or two plays mm-hmm. go your way, you have a different score. Now you're looking at a team that maybe has five, six wins, and we're ha- having a whole completely oh, yeah, different yep. conversation. The offense has been good. It, it always has been able to put up points. It's the defense that lets them down. It hurt them again last week against Van Wert. Van Wert scores two touchdowns in the last five minutes of the game. They get the one point victory. You know, Kenton just right now kind of always seems like they do just enough, and then you know, there's some little snake bitten, and something happens, and and they can't close out that game. For Shawnee, the offense had gone away. They've had some injuries. They lost their quarterback yeah. um, against Walpock. They've been playing with a senior backup QB who has been getting better and getting his feet underneath him, and it doesn't ever really matter. Um, apparently, unless you're Columbus Grove, who you put, you know it however much experience you put at the quarterback position, it takes a little bit of time, right? It It, does, yeah, it does. And, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit of a struggle. Caleb Bacon has been doing a good job. He's been seeming more comfortable. The offense has been looking a little bit better. And then they get another injury loss last week. Cole Sutherland, their starting running back, middle linebacker. I I was telling somebody last week, the kid runs like he's mad at the ground. Like he is such a hard runner. He flies to everything. He, He is a spark plug on defense, on offense. He's all over the place. He gets injured early in that game against OG. He's not going to be able to play this week. Now, okay, now we got two big injuries that we're trying to come back from is that offense is still trying to figure itself out. Um, a, a lot of still good attitudes. Their heads are still up. You know, I, I think a lot of guys feel really good about where the Shawnee program is going. But like you said, being able to walk off the field for the final time with a win, it sure does make everybody feel a little bit better than walking off right, for the final time right. without yeah, and it's not gonna. It's not going to correct everything that's happened to you all year, but... No. It's certainly better than the alternative. All right, game number four. Two teams that couldn't be any different offensively. <laughs> St. Mary's at Bath. Mark Shine, Jack McGuire on the call. You got a team that will never throw the ball, and then you got a team that can't throw it enough. Yeah, I, there's not enough uh, offense. They might as well just throw two balls in at once with Bath <laughs> on, on offense just to, to do something. But, uh, yeah, St. Mary's, you know, Toughest game Wapak's had this year, seven and two, back to being St. Mary's football. There's a stretch there. We kind of wondered maybe if things got away from them a little bit, but uh, clinched a a spot in Region 12, so we know it's uh, on the line for them. Looks like Bath is in in Region 20. Uh, They've dropped three of four, though, so they're trying to to right the ship and and, – offensively, all sorts of weapons. And we talk about, you know, Miles and I got to see them a couple of times, talked about how good Bath is. You know, the questions have always been defense. Well, this week, you know, like St. Mary's has never in the 24 years I've been involved with high school football, they have never once fooled you what they're going to try to do, right? They're not... They're not all of a sudden going to come out and five wides. Hey, <laughs> right, this is yeah, the no, night we're throwing the ball 45 times. Right. No, they're, it's going to be the double wing. You know, the six plays they're going to run, and they're yeah. going to beat you with them. Yeah. And, you know, the most impressive thing about that, right, is what you, everybody knows. And it's like, <laughs> and, and, they're like and they're like, yeah, we're cool with you knowing. Good luck stopping it. Right. And more often than not, nobody can do it. You know, favorite thing I used to tell, so I got to see a lot of uh, Liberty Center under Rex Lindgren okay. back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Rex was so confident. He would yell to the other sideline and like, hey, so left tackle, I, my, my running back is running right here. And defenses would put three, four guys in that spot, and they're still going for 70 <laughs> yards. Like, it's not going to... 
Hey, three uh, B gap. We're running B gap. Oh, oh, okay. Like you, you could have yeah. had fifteen guys on the field, and it wasn't going to matter. I think the meanest thing that St. Mary's does is when they do decide to throw the ball. It's almost like that backbreaker because it's run, 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 run. Three hundred fifty yards of of rushing touchdowns. We're doing good. Hey, now we're going to throw that thirty-five yard yeah. pat and oh, it'll oh, go for oh, a touchdown. Oh. You're like, wait is a, a minute. Is that a linebacker? <laughs> <I've seen laughs> cheating in? It, it, oh. Yeah, oh, they they did it. They did it last week against Elida. Um, they did it against Shawnee earlier this season. And I could, even as a fan in the mm-hmm. stands, when they did it against Shawnee, I was like, "Oh, that hurts." It's just you're right I was like, you it's just, so deflating. You're yeah. like, "Oh, that hurts." You did yeah, us dirty <laughs> that, 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 that hurts. Why? Coach Fry, what are you doing? Now, you know, St. Mary's. We all know what they're going to do. They're led by a three-headed monster, Caleb Schmidt, Dominic Osborne, the two leading guys back there. Dominic Osborne coming off 170 plus yards rushing. He had five touchdowns last week. Just an absolute beast uh, uh, of a week. You mentioned they hit a little bit of a lull earlier in this season. They lost back to back games. Yeah. And then they've, whatever was going on, they fixed. In the last couple of weeks, the amount of points that they've been able to, it's just been an onslaught yeah, on been. the scoreboard. They, they've scored over 50 and 60 in the, each of the last two weeks. They seem to have figured it out at the exact right time. And then they go up against a Bath team. We mentioned great offense. They can throw the ball all over the place. When Mikey Hale got gets things going, he's one of the better running backs in yeah, this area. He's, he's uh, been surprisingly good. Yeah, Zach Welsh can throw it all over the place. He pulls it down. He is a true dual-threat quarterback. But that defense... It, it, they are suspect at best at times. Now, you saw what they can do when they're on it, right? They shut out a defiance team two weeks ago yeah. that nobody saw right. coming, and that is a run-heavy team. They shut down 2,000-yard back at Anthony Wilder. They Noah Gomez had nowhere to go. That's a running team, and Bath figured out how to stop them. Do you think they got enough to stop this St. Mary's team? Uh, uh, no, unfortunately. I you know. No disrespect to Defiance, and obviously a program I could see quite a bit. And Coach Cooper's been a guy I've known for a long time, but Defiance isn't St. Mary's. And no, I mean, like you said, Wilder's a great back. Gomez is a great back. Uh, I know the quarterback has been a tough spot for them. Brez Zipfel's been battling injuries through uh, part of the year. And uh, just St. Mary's is kind of next, right? We always talk about Wapak is is the next level, but St. Mary's is not too far hanging around. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're hanging around uh, just above everyone else. All right, game number five, staying in the Western Buckeye League, Wapakoneta at Salina. Dave Bowen, Josiah Stober on that call. A year ago, this was a huge game as Walpock came in needing a win just to get a share of that Western Buckeye League title. This year, they've already wrapped it up. They got the outright win. Salina, at times they've looked really good, playing a little bit of up and down um, this season. But you got to think that they got a little bit of revenge on their mind. Hey, you know what? We may not win a conference title with this mm-hmm. one, but we'd love to give that one blemish to Wapak. Yeah, and this is uh, you know Wapak. We've talked about it through uh, through the season. They're set. They know what their playoff picture is going to look like. Salina, it's a little murky with what's going on here, and uh, it coming off. Uh, I thought they played really well in beating Defiance last week. And again, like we just said with Defiance and Defiance battling injuries here second half of the season, take nothing away from Salina and what they were able to do, held Defiance to just one touchdown. They got some guys that uh, really impressed me when I got to see them this year, but uh, they're going to have – I don't know if they'll have enough to match up with Wapak, but there's – like you said, there's a lot of factors in this one You know, the if, Green Dogs. It, what do you do if you're Coach Moyer, right? You know that – really nothing at stake here except potentially with a loss you're going to fall out of maybe one of those top four spots how long are you letting the starters play this one how long you know because you you want to be as healthy as you right. can going in, into the playoffs no matter what that first round matchup looks like you still would like to have two home playoff games you're guaranteed at worst one mm-hmm. you know how, how if you're coach Moore, how you play in this one you know, if this one gets out of hand early how how long is that leash with your starters? Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question, and thankfully I've never had to coach uh, football <laughs> before, so not anything I have to to worry about. But uh, if this is one that gets out of hand, or like, and the, also in the back of your mind, right, you're going to get a 15, a 16 seed. Traditionally, not you know the expanded playoffs we've seen, right? You no. Know, what 15 and 16 seeds look like. And, and There's some upsets. There's there, there been one some, or two, but some, yeah. probably not in D3. That right, D3 is right. and You also loaded. run the chance of a 3-7 and seven team, thankful to be there. So do you do you play this week as if you're going to, you know, hey, if I can get my guys half a football off knowing 
Or can I can I wait till next week and, and Yep, you're right because that maybe happens. You know, do you right. want to do that two weeks in a row yeah, where you give guys no, off? Then, then do I do I worry about um oh, well, with that freak do I want injury? My guys being rusty. Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. Because so. because you know that that happened to a team uh, earlier or last this last week. You know, a little late in the game, game out of hand. They left some guys in that you know maybe if nothing happens, nobody says a word. But because somebody gets injured, right. it's yep. Why were they still in the game? And you know now you're missing a huge piece of your team. And I, there's a lot. I like you. I've never coached football. I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> and we get to just sit here and talk about it like right. a couple oh, yeah, of dumb idiots. Yeah. But you know, um, it'll be interesting. You know that still is a rivalry game that still does mean a lot to both of those teams. So we'll see. Caleb Moore has been playing so good. I. I he every week it's been fun to see his stat line. I swear for about three or four weeks now, the kid has had no more than two incompletions every single week <laughs> 23 of 25, 16 of 18, 17 of 19. Like, it's like he feels like he has to throw two away just to make everybody feel a little bit better, and everything else is right on target. So, you know, the, the uh, one time uh, I got to call their game this year, I joked with Miles. Because you know, I you, we get the you know the the stat packet from the WBL does a great job with with what they send out to to everyone before a game, and you looked at a seventy eight percent completion percentage or whatever it was, and twelve touchdowns, no interceptions at the time, and I looked at and I just yeah, but it's it's a you know it's an inflated Bruce Gradkowski number, right? You know at Toledo <laughs> it was seventy yeah, percent because yeah. they're th- right. Yeah. It's Drew Brees at seventy five percent because it's five yard pass the screens, yeah. and then you watch the game, you're like. Oh, this no, boy, it's not. He, he throws the ball down the field. Yeah, he does. He throws it a lot down the yep. field. And it's not nine and, passes a game and or anything like that. And yeah. catch it, and they're really good. How, they're really wide open. Um, this is there, There's Division One talent all over in all oh, those yeah. positions. Oh, yeah. I mean, that Walpock team is loaded, you know, and it's going to be really interesting come tournament time to see – how they match up as they move through those playoffs. There's a lot of really good teams up top uh, ahead of them as well in that mm-hmm. top, you know, one, two, three, one, basically one through five in their region. Um, you know, nothing gets easier for Wapak, that, that's for sure. And I sh- probably should have looked this up before we started, but Wapak goes south, right? They're in yeah. 12? Yeah. So they go they yeah. go south. Yeah, so there's some some tough yeah. Cincinnati area teams they'll have to deal with. So, all right, final game on tap for WSN in Week 10. It is Waynesfield at Ridgemont. Danny Holbrook, Garen, Darren Gilbert on the call. And this is an interesting one in the sense that Ridgemont still has something to play for. I mean, they, they only got right. the one conference loss. If mm-hmm. somehow USV slips up against North Baltimore, they could still share uh, uh, some of that conference crown. Waynesfield not going to be a conference champion for the first time in a couple of years. A new coach, Chris Summers, has come in. He's done a nice job with them. Their only two losses are against Harden Northern and USV. It's been an interesting conference to watch uh, the NWCC has, and uh, this one should be another good one. I mean, I think Danny and Darren get a good one. Yeah, and you know the winner, more than likely, I think is going to end up at a top-four seed. You're looking at, at two playoff games, so a lot to play for there. But this is uh, – you know, go uh, Waynesfield comes in a winner of what five in a row, and they've done fairly well. You know, Ridgemont's done it uh, a different style. You saw a fourteen-seven game against Hard Northern, a six-three game against Corey Rawson. So they'll get down and dirty, play some defense. Yeah. And that set six-three game was is such a head scratcher because Corey Rawson struggling. Didn't no, I don't think anybody thought Ridgemont was going to have any problems with that one. And then you know the. the they, they Corey Ross found a way. They slowed him down. Uh, third quarter touchdown ended up being the difference in that one. But um, a, a great slate of games in, on tap for WSN this week. Week 10 is always exciting. So many things on the line. Uh, conference championships all over the place up for grabs. Everybody trying to jockey for that position for the playoffs. And, you know, talking about that, there's a lot of games, you know, Randy, that are in the area as far as – um, playoff implications. Mm-hmm. Some teams playing to get in. Yep. Some teams playing to get that home game. Like you just mentioned, playing to maybe get two home games. It's really exciting to to watch. Yeah, I was the uh, the before I I was a broadcaster. I was a newspaper reporter, and that was always my my favorite part. Was you know weeks eight, nine, and ten. You were the guy, or I should say you. I was the guy, not that. Okay, all right. Well, team <laughs> A, if they win this week, lose this week win this next week, I think they can have, right, you were the, right, I was the guy that I'm going to, I'm projecting seven and three and a number six seed, and then uh, I think you and I kind of do the same thing. We both found uh, 
a fantastic 50 and Drew Pastor. Yep. And you're like, oh, there's someone that does this for me. I'm yeah, just going to so copy him. So much easier. Someone much, so, much smarter than me yeah. who knows the math. And I'm just going to, oh, yeah, that's it's been right. Every place I've gone to this week is uh, talking about playoffs. I, uh, so I, I live uh, a great deal north of here in Fulton County. You know, uh, and I uh, uh, work with uh, special needs people. And uh, Special Olympics of Fulton County is in the building that I work in. And so uh, this last weekend, we had a fundraiser, and the uh, local Eagles uh, helps raise money. Well, after our event ended, I kind of hung around the bar, as I've been known to to tend to do from time to time. And, of course, uh, everyone in the the place knows me, so they want to start talking about the Del, you know, it was in Delta, so the Delta Panthers, and anyone that's not really familiar with Delta, uh, Mike Vickers come back after a long reign. He's closing in 200 career wins, kind of rebuilt the program. So I had a 20 minute argument with the guy at the bar because so it's Delta Evergreen. We talk about rivalries and a rivalry that's important to me is an Evergreen student, Delta Evergreen. Oh well, well we need it with the win, and and I pulled up my phone. And I went to Drew Pastor and said, no, no, you're, you're okay with the loss. No, 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 that thing's not right. <laughs> no, I, I, I assure you. And, and then they came back with, you know, like, like, like you've got with the, the Joe Idol printouts. No, yep. no, this is, okay, well, you got to know what you're looking for right. on Joe Idol because yep. it's not, tell, like, I'm, I'm telling you, like. Everybody sees that range and they're like, yeah, oh, we're good. Yeah, like, well, this, no, no, This guy, really. like, hey, see, it says right here. So, like, he's, like, now, again. I, I will give uh, the fantastic 50 credit, right? Because he, he sticks to his projections, and mm-hmm. it could be he's projecting you to win. Now, you could lose. Like, those are the two options. Yep. And then it does change a little bit. But the, this guy's right, like no. 90%, 95% of the time. So uh, no offense, drunk guy at the bar, but I'm going to go with what this guy's saying. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of teams that are sitting on the edge right now that could could find themselves in the playoffs. Van Wert right now, they're sitting 17. They're uh, Division Four, Region 4. 14. They're at 17. Elida at 18. We talked about Elida kind of struggling. You know, they're not into that uh, what uh, Joe Otto likes to put as control your own destiny, right? right? They, that, which means you got to win. When you're in. You yeah, need some much, help. Type pretty much, st- yeah. yeah when so you're in. He, he, they need some help, but Van Wert playing a lot better. I don't know if you have you seen Van Wert this year. I got to see them very early, in, or no, I got to see them about the midway point. I had their Ottawa Glendorf game, so they've been playing better. You know, they end up losing that game against OG that I think was a shock to some yeah, people. 30, 35, 34. Um, you know, back they they've won two or three in a row now. The offense looks a, a, a lot better. Yeah. The, it was a big win for them last week because they stopped turning the ball over was the big thing. Yeah, that was well. Yeah. And Briston Wise leading the entire Western Buckeye League in rushing um, at, from the quarterback position. He one of those true dual threat quarterbacks like Zach Walsh we talked about they they need a win this week Elida same thing they're on the outside looking in right now but two teams that kind of seem to be going in different ways but the reason I mentioned that and there's some other teams too that are kind of the outside looking in but the expanded playoffs now we're about two years into that yeah that sounds okay I want to get your thoughts I've been asking a lot of people about this because I like it there's a lot of people that don't and I understand why. Their arguments are teams like Delphi St. John's, who is really struggling right now. They've had a lot of injuries. Maybe they got things going last week against Parkway. They put some points back up on the board. They're sitting 15. They could lose this week, have two wins, and they're going to get in. Right? They win, they're definitely in. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have teams that are sitting around with five, six, seven wins who aren't going to get in, depending on where they're at. I like this expanded playoff for one reason and one reason only. We're sitting here in week 10, and when you look through the Joe Idol stuff, there's maybe three, four teams that have been truly mathematically eliminated. That is it. Right, yeah. Other than that, that, there are a ton. There's still hope. There's still that carrot. There's still that thing for that coach to say, hey, listen, boys, we go out here and we take care of business and Mm -hmm. we play hard and we get this win. You never know what happens. We have an opportunody. And I I don't know when the – the blow up of the computer points started. I remember being the kid in high school. You waited until was it Wednesday at noon? They were posted on the OHSA yep. website, right? Yep. And then Joe Idol became a thing. But it, I I don't know when the blow up of the points happened because it used to be it was something that was never talked about until maybe week eight. You started to go, hey, you know what? We have a shot, but. I hear people now, and again, 
people like us are partly responsible for that, but the two guys that do it aren't here this week, so we can blame them. <laughs> but, like, I, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine about why is – the the non conference is, is so important now, right? Because yeah. the the con we we talked about this before we started. Every it doesn't matter what conference you're in. It's the conference play is going to be a wash, right? Because mm-hmm. you're going to have the you're you're not going to get all the points you can get because you're gonna you're gonna beat half the teams. If you're good, now the bottom feeders are going to lose to everyone. The top teams are going to beat everyone. But like the teams we're talking about in the middle, you're going to beat half the teams. You're going to lose to half the teams. Maybe you get lucky and the team you beat beats a team that you lost to, and you get you know you get helped out. But I, you know, these last couple of years, I'm at week one. I, not, I'm not even at week one. I'm in, I'm at scrimmages. Oh, hey, I'm going to see this team next week. I'm going to go talk to their coach and see what they're up to. And then you're like, hey, why are you making this two hour and fifteen minute drive to play so and so? Like, why? Why was that? Well, you see, like we, if they can get to four wins, they give us twelve points, and they're a small school in a big division, yep. and that second level helps out. Yep. And I'll tell you what. Uh, wait, and, what? And a great example of that is Lima Senior. Lima Senior's non-conference schedule looked really good prior to the season. They had Pickle on there. They had Finley on yep. there. Well, those guys haven't had a great season. And so those wins don't help, haven't helped them nearly as much as a lot of people thought they would prior to the year. Well, now you go and you go undefeated in the T-Cow. Well, the T-Cow is way down. Lima Senior has yet to play a team with a winning record. It's not their fault. They scheduled some tough teams. Yeah, They put some teams on yep. that non-conference that they thought would help them, mm-hmm. but it hasn't. So now Lima Senior coming into Week 10, sitting 9-0, and are ninth in their region. They're not even in playoff hosting position yet. Yeah, it's they so- have to beat Start, who is the first team with a winning record that they'll play to even get in. On the other side, Start has to beat Lima Senior to even get into the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing how all this works, and I, I'm for the most part, I'm for the expanded playoffs. Yeah, we're gonna. There's going to be a couple of these 16-1 games that are going to be, you know, 62 yep, to nothing are. with the running clock, right. you know, but we've had them in the regular season, exactly. so let's not, you know, but there will be, you know, a, a overinflated four is going to be in trouble against a 13 late in the third quarter, no. a, a 12 that had a two-week bad stretch who shouldn't really be a 12 is going to go to a five and pull, a, pull off a touchdown upset so Mm -hmm. i'm i'm for it i probably would have been for the 12 team that was you know the original plan where the the top four would have had a bye week does more football hurt anyone no no i don't think so the only thing is you know and you hear people talk about the you know top and bottom and all those things and the you know like you just talked about the blowouts and all that stuff but you know there's been 15s that have won yep there have been 14s that have won yep you know, that's why you play the game. You got to come, you got to be ready. And, you know, I like it. I think it also gives people like us something to talk about. You know, there's a lot of these teams that we wouldn't really have a whole lot of interest in because they would have been out three weeks ago based off of the math where, you know, here we come into week 10 teams with two, three, four wins still got something to play for. I I love it. It's exciting. It makes high school football even better. How many, how many coaches look like better coaches? Cause now they're playoff. Exactly. Exactly. Schools get to put the playoff appearances on the Bears. It's great. All right. Before we get out of here, last final thing, we would be remiss if we didn't talk. We said there was a one and a one a game this week, right? We already talked about, you know, Columbus Grove Bluffton. The other one, Coldwater, Marion, local, two of the most dominant teams in the entire state of Ohio and have been for quite a while. I got some stats I'm going to read to you that that's going to show that uh, Marion local going for the all time record for the OHSAA to uh, pass Delphi St. John's if they can get their 58th straight win. Let, let me just how prolific these two teams are. All right. Let, let me read these off to you. And I found these out on Drew Pasture's site. OK, so most playoff wins since 2002. Marion Local is first with 88. Wow. And this is not just their division. This is the entire state, all divisions, all okay. regions, okay? They have 88 playoff wins. Number two, Coldwater with 75. Most state titles since 2002, Marion Local with 12. Tied for second, Coldwater with seven. All right? Most regional titles since 2002, Marion Local has 17. They are first. Any guesses on who's second? I'm going to guess Coldwater. There you go. Coldwater with 13. Longest streaks of state final appearances. Not overall appearances, just most appearances in a row. Okay. First, 
Marion Local with nine from 2011 to 2019. Second, Coldwater with eight, 2009 to 2016. Uh, I don't want to skip any because there's a ton of these, all right? Uh, longest streak of regional titles since 2002. Mary oh, Local Local's first. Got like 32 in a row. <laughs> they, got not, they, they went through a streak of nine <laughs> straight regional titles from 2011 to 2019. They clearly took a year off, and now they're back at it. Yep. Um, two, number two, Coldwater with eight, 2009 to 2016, which, which means um, – Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So longest streak of regional final appearances since 2002. Just the amount of times they've appeared. Okay. Okay. In a regional final since 2002. Any guesses who's sitting first? Um, boy, uh, Ashtabula St. John. Who? Kirkland. <laughs> <laughs> but two, Marion Local. They're right behind them with 13 from 2011 to the present. Number three, don't worry. Coldwater's right there with 12 from 2007 to 2008. Longest streak of winning one plus playoff game. So just winning one Ooh. playoff game since 2002. Marion Local, 19 from 2005 to the present. They have not lost at least one. The first round in the playoffs since 2004, Sev- 19 straight. And in second, Coldwater was 17 from 2002 to 2018. All of this stuff also means that in a period from 2011 to 2016, both Marion Local and Coldwater were in the state finals at the same time. These are two of the most prolific programs in the entire state. They now meet up in week 10, both undefeated, both for a MAC championship. Coldwater with an opportunity to halt the longest winning streak in the country. I, I, it doesn't, does it get any bigger and more on the line than no, that? No, I don't think it gets any bigger than that. That is, uh, that is a huge game. And here's my question to you, the question everybody is dying to know, Randy, who wins? Oh boy, I I want I don't know why. I just want to say cold water. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like the 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 level of football, just I don't plain football that we're gonna see is gonna be off the charts, right? It's gonna be I, I, I'm worried that this is gonna be a game where maybe they move five yards and punt, move five yards I, and punt. I, right? These two teams, just, these defenses, Mary Local's giving up less than three points a game. Coldwater's giving up nine points a game. Their defenses are ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's what we brought up earlier. It's going to be a block kick. It's going to be a, a muffed punt. And it's going to be a, yep. And the thing we talked about with Bluffton, they you know they turn the ball over less, less than Columbus Grove does. Marion Local does not make mistakes. They just don't beat themselves. Marion Local. I've been saying this all year. Marion Local to me is in an, an era right now that very few teams have found themselves in, which is they get the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. You, until somebody shows that they can beat them, there's really no reason to pick anything different. In my mind, I'm taking Marion Local. I think they set the all-time win streak. I think that they get through another state title. And if you're Coach Goodwin, I don't know what else you can possibly accomplish. Maybe he has a mic drop moment. He's like, all right, I'm done. I got the win streaks. We got the titles. We got all these records. Somebody else can take over this show. I mean, he he is such an amazing coach. That program's incredible. Uh, you know, it. it Week 10 is going to be huge, and WSN is going to be front and center for a bunch of those games. Playoff implications on the line. So much happening. I I can't wait to watch it. Time to move on. It is a Buckeye chatter. No Ohio State game this last weekend, which maybe is a good thing for all of us, Randy, right? We get a chance to breathe. All the panic gets a moment to just kind of get away from all of us, all of us Buckeye fans after that loss to Oregon, and we've had a week off to kind of get refocused. Some some of us had to sit through our alma maters winning 13-6 to in the middle of nowhere, Illinois, but yeah, (laughs) I understand. All right, so this Buckeye team, it's crazy that we're sitting here and the concern is defense, right? Because all we've been told, all we've been fed is mm-hmm. that this is the greatest defense that has ever walked the halls of Ohio State. The best team money can buy. The yep. defense is the greatest one that we'll ever see. And then the thing that failed the most spectacularly, and that's hard to say considering how the clock management went at the end of the game, but the biggest glaring issue was the defense. Yeah, you know, the, the biggest thing that I've heard about this week was just the apparently the rift going on between Jim Knowles and Larry yeah, Johnson. You know, what's going right on now. where, you know, 
are are the are the linemen are they going rogue? Are they doing their own thing? Are they even li- which coach are they listening to? Oh. Which coach are they listening to more? Whose direction are they taking? There's some there are some issues that are going to need to be cleaned up, and and Ryan Day has. Uh, Proven, I don't know if that's the right word, that I, personnel might not be his best suit. This is something that he doesn't do well. Uh, you know, he – and you talk about the offense, you're going to bring in a – you know, you, you brought in a very special offensive coordinator, but that was kind of – I think the offense coordinator kind of sought you out to get right. the job right. Like, right. Hey, listen, this NIL thing, this is weird. Like, I want to coach, yeah. you know. Why, you, we see it at the high school level all the time, how many head coaches go, I don't want to be uh, a yeah. head coach. I'll I'm help good. you out, buddy, but yeah. I don't want to be a head coach. Yep. I think that's exactly what happened here. And now Ryan Day is going to have to sit, you know, he's going to have to fire someone in the offseason, whether he wants to or not. Yeah. And it's going to be problematic because yeah. no, this I, isn't what he does. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, you know, I, I mean, I've had this conversation with Miles and Danny um, in a bunch of different, you know, environments, including off air. And, you know, those two, Jim Knowles and, and Larry Johnson, have been butting heads apparently since day one, okay. right? Like this hasn't been right. like a new, you know, development in the program. But when you're winning – and your side of the football isn't the problem, mm-hmm. it doesn't get as much attention. There's, you know, there's some articles here or there. There's some whispers here and there, but nothing that anybody's paying a lot of attention to because, well, that's fine. They don't have to get along to be successful, right. right? Like, okay, cool. But when that starts to get in the way of winning and you have a national, I don't want to say embarrassment. That seems way too harsh, right? But something that is just that glaring on national primetime TV. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. If this got yeah. buried at, you know, noon or 3.30 on regional network, you know, you're, you might be okay. But when you're primetime and this is the game that you're, you know, your network's been touting for six days that you've been having, and I, I never got the chance to see the numbers. can only imagine – what the number was of people that watched it. That yeah. is, yeah, that's the part that hurts. Right. And so, I mean, the big question is, is, you know, at some point Ryan Day is going to have to get involved, right? Like yeah. he's going to have to do right. something. You can't ignore this rift if it's hurting your team. But besides all of those personnel issues, will this team, do you think, are they going to rebound from this loss to Oregon and go on to win the Big Ten and, you know, ultimately a national championship, which is what the season should be, natty or bust. Right. Now, do they have the ability? Yeah, I, they absolutely have. They're one of the most talented teams in the country. Is this going to be uh, – this is going to go two ways, right? Like everyone's going to – they're going to quote-unquote circle the wagons and, you know, this is going to be uh, the rallying cry and, hey, we can't let what happened in Oregon happen again. Or this is going to be a thing that's just – that rift is going to grow and grow and grow and – Hey, we're going to see something. Maybe, oh, well, that's never happened before. What's going on here? That's never happened before. What's going on here? And before you know it, you're two or three losses deep. And that's, yeah. 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 I, yeah I could see the indigestion. Yeah. Right well, I, I listen, it, I've, I, I've said, I said it way back in August. I, from the very, and this is just a, <laughs> this is my continual rant about Ohio State. You know, my issue has been from the very beginning that, you know, this team is supposed to be this great team coming through Ohio State and all these things that we've heard, right? But for some reason, we couldn't settle on a QB1 until middle of August, right? That doesn't scream, we're good, we're confident, we can, we're, we're ready to mm-hmm. roll here when we're still trying, we're undecided about the most important position on our team two weeks before the season starts. Now, these two that sit across from me normally and, you know, Miles and that, you know, rose-colored glass-wearing Danny always tell oh, me, oh, they're it's, both, it's they're this, it's this, it's this. Yeah. You know, but that's where it started for me. And I'd always yeah. kind of had this impending doom feeling that, you know, like, I don't know, the season, like, we should all be celebrating the season and enjoying it, and this should be great. And I, every week, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, yeah, they should, but are they going to type of thing? And then Oregon happens. And I felt like a lot of Ohio State fans were dismissing Oregon because they got off to that slow start, won a couple of close games. Well, that Oregon loss or that Oregon win, um, I'm sorry, Boise State win. Yeah. You know, that doesn't look that bad now that that was a close one, right? right like, yeah, they're turning out to be real good. Boise, yeah, Boise is going to be better than people think. And, and things are, are going a certain way. Now, you know, they got to get through Nebraska this week, which seems to be down. They're going to look to bounce back after getting just run out of the stadium by Indiana. Then we got Penn State coming in. 
this is another top five matchup potentially. Mm-hmm. If they don't win that one, and we're looking at two mm-hmm. losses, even if it's to two teams that were ranked in the top five, there is no Big Ten title. We're looking at a lower seed if we even win out at that point. Somebody's going to have to answer for this. Now, do I think that they can still rebound and win the Big Ten? Absolutely. Do I think that they will? I mean, I think that the needle points more towards they will than they won't. Yeah, I would. Agree I with mean, that. I, I think that you know they they can beat Penn State. I mean, I think the best thing happening to them is a noon kickoff in Happy Valley, not a whiteout at night, right? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, you're lot. absolutely right. So they they kind of dodge that bullet there, mm-hmm. but that still be a tough game, but. You know, I think that they can win that one. There's a couple of more ranked opponents on that schedule. Is Indiana for real? Eh, we'll find out. The schedule hasn't been overly difficult, but they are ranked. Uh, you know, we do still have the team up north coming up on the schedule. There are other hurdles to cross. I think they can win all of those. Whatever is going on in, on the defensive side of things, though, has to get fixed. This this offense, I don't think, is so prolific that they can just outscore everybody or they can win shootouts. They need the defense to get stops when it matters most. If whatever's going on, on the defensive side of the ball doesn't change, right? Yeah, it's something, this yeah. is going to get rough. So. I'm going to compare it to this. We we've seen it all the time. Now this World Series, notwithstanding, because the two highest priced teams made the World Series, but how many times in pro sports have we seen the team with all the talent, the team with the the most free agents, right? They don't gel. You've got eleven guys playing for yourself, right? Right. And that was always the difference between pro and college, right? Because yeah. college, they, these guys come in because they believe in something, whether it's the the coach that, you know, got them in on their scholarship or they believe in a program or they, you know, these are kids, you know, we'll say Ohio State, for example, these are Columbus kids who yeah. know how good this is. We don't have that in college sports anymore. And right. How, you know, yeah. it, it was 11, right? It was 11 silver bullets. Well, I think it's 11 singular silver bullets. And I think you're learning, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing okay for myself, but hey, if... Like my my NFL stock is still okay if I don't win the national championship. Right, and if anything, it may have gotten hurt. If you're Denzel Burke, you're catching a lot of strays yeah, right you, now. Uh, you you had a, it was one bit. bad game. Yeah. It felt like you should have enough goodwill to get through that. Mm-hmm. But there's been a lot of talk over the last two. If you're Denzel Burke, you can't wait to get back on the field because right. for two weeks you've been getting beat up and you've been seeing your stock hit. So hopefully they'll get those things turned around and, you know, in a couple of weeks we're a lot more cheery about Ohio State at this point. It is time for the Power 5 football teams in Northwest Ohio, Randy. And, you know, the segment's been getting um, a little bit more predictable every week as we move through the season. Hasn't been a lot of movement in the top five. I imagine you and I have probably about the same teams. You may have a little different, though. You're a little bit farther north than I get. You've seen some different teams. For me... Marion Local, Bluffton, Columbus Grove, Walpock, Coldwater, no particular order except for probably Marion Local. You know, 57 straight wins, even in no particular order, you still get the number one yeah, spot. Right. You know, going for that record this weekend against Coldwater. Like we talked about, um, you know, we just got done talking uh, earlier with uh, Coach Richards and Landon over at Bluffton. Undefeated, undefeated Columbus Grove. Both those teams playing great. Should be a huge matchup. They definitely have earned their way into that top five. Uh, I, I don't see any other teams that we could really swap out, but, I mean, you got a different five than me? No, mine's pretty much the same. Uh, after getting the chance to watch Wapak for the first time here recently, Wapak's in my in my top five. You got to put Coldwater. You got to put Marion Local in there, right? Uh, I'm going to go Grove and Bluffton. I just think that uh, – Yep. Probably the easy way out since I get to call the game, right? <laughs> Don't want to pick one favorite over the other. So let's throw them both in. And, yeah. uh, you know, no particular, like you said, no particular order, which changed because last time I was here, I had to rank my power five. So, oh, you know, I'm, we I'm listen, glad. listen, those other two aren't here. It, you know, we don't, right. have, we, don't, we don't have to worry about the brow beating from Danny and Miles at all. We can do whatever we want. That's right. Right. That's what right. are they going to do about it? All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, those five have really been standing on their own head and shoulders above yeah. everybody else pretty much from the very beginning of the season. You know, Marion Local's been up there. Grove's been up there. Bluffton's been up there. Um, Walpock I, I, has really stood out, especially over maybe the last three or four weeks. Kayla Moyer is playing on a whole different level right now. Um, a lot of great football being played. 
we'll see what happens it's, come postseason. I, I imagine the same thing probably goes on at your house, but it's amazing with that that extra coaching with father son. Oh, at home right, does, yeah, right? it's weird, right? Yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it, it is paying off in a big, big <laughs> way right now. Is. So, all right, well, that is going to wrap up another episode of the Three Wise Men. Randy, thank you so much for coming in, filling in for the guys. Um, you know, they can stay away. You can come back yeah, anytime no, you want. We'll push it. them out. We, you know, right. you know, I, this might be the best show that was ever done, especially without Danny and Miles, right? I mean, I mean come I on. I wasn't going to say it because I, it's, <laughs> you ask Miles and, you know, full. I think everyone knows Miles and I team up about 95% of the time for broadcast. Miles will tell you that there's a lot of, a lot of egos out there in TV. I'm not one of them. So I wasn't going to be the guy that says I did I, the best listen, show. I got, I that's got not, you. That's yep. not me. That's not my lane. Hey, listen, we're going to find say out. It, I'm not going to, oh, I, 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 I won't. How do I want to say this? I will not not disagree. There you go. Right? I like Something, it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and listen, we're going to find out if they listen, because if they do, you and I are going to get a text message in you the guys, next 24 uh, to 48 hours. Yeah. yeah, we're, we're going to know real quick. Yeah, so it'll be true. fine. So, all right. Well, thanks for tuning in. We will see everybody next week on another edition of the Three Wise Men.